Okay. So, uh, yeah, we're about halfway through this uh, COP26. Um, it finishes on Friday, I think. Uh, so, uh, another few days of it uh, to go. Um, I'm going to amble around for a little bit at the moment. When um, I mentioned before, some years ago, Julie and I went to uh, Beirut and uh, uh, spent uh, not that long there, actually, only a week or so there. And uh, But we, we went over... Um, to do some stuff with some Christians over there, and we uh, were round at uh, the, the the Bible College that's over there in Beirut, and uh, the uh, the broadcasting station Sat Seven, and all that kind of stuff. And we were there, but when we arrived on the first day, we checked into this hotel, and um, it's fair to say the hotel had seen better days actually, but um, it had survived the civil war just. And uh, so we go in there and check in, and all the rest of it. First evening, we um, go downstairs for our meal because um, we thought we'd, we'd just check out the hotel restaurant. And um, when we when we sit down at the table and all the rest of it, um, a lot of excitement going on uh, because we're the only guests. So there's four of us, there's uh, Julie and myself and there's two others. And we kind of sat there in the restaurant and all the rest of it and uh, all the usual banter going on, where you're from, what have you got? It's fantastic, thank you for coming over here uh, because there weren't many international visitors at that time because there'd been... Um, a lot of bombs have been going off in the city, so for obvious reasons, not many people were going there. Uh, just us, it turned out. But um, And um, the guys in the kitchen um, were really excited about all of this and about seeing us there. And they, they came to us and they said, um, would you like us just to cook for you a traditional Lebanese meal? So not on the menu or anything like that. We'll just, we'll just, we'll just do it. And uh, we kind of looked at each other and said, well, all right then. It'd be rude not to really, wouldn't it? So away they go and they went for it. And we had this banquets, didn't we, that was served to us. It was course after course of this food, and they were so proud of what they were doing, and they wanted us to experience um, Lebanese hospitality and bless us with this, and our taste buds were overwhelmed with all this fantastic stuff, and it went on and on and on and on, and we had to eat it and eat it and eat it and eat it, because it would have been rude not to, wouldn't it? So away we went. And then at the end of this uh, this fantastic meal, they all came out and stood in front of us for us to say thank you and applaud them and all the rest of it. And um, it was it was quite fantastic, this banquet, and um, it was great. And it set me thinking about church. It kind of um, we we like it when we when we cook and eat together and have lunch and all the rest of it but can can you imagine for a moment that we've decided to come to church all of us and we're going to cook this meal uh, for us and in our fellowship at the time there are lots of other folks there from all sorts of different countries that have come to join us. We've got people from the African nations. We've got people from the South American nations. And we've got people from the European nations and all over. And they're here. And we want to cook for them. And suddenly we start thinking to ourselves, do they like fish and chips? Do they like beef stew? Do they understand what you know, mutton is and all the rest of it. And, and we start thinking about questions about that. And because we want it to, we want them to enjoy it. We want them to be blessed by this. And they're thinking to themselves when they're here as well, would we quite like to give them these English folks a taste of some of our African food or our Asian food or our South American food? And suddenly this, this meal gets bigger and bigger and this banquet starts of people wanting to bless one another through food and through fellowship and will this be too hot for them how do I need to tone down the spices and that concern starts to come out one for another and we start thinking of one another in an international sense through this huge meal that is going on in our churches we're mixing that way and suddenly Barriers start to break down, don't they, as we approach one another in this way, in this, this desire to bless. And in all of this, there is a picture of Scripture, of the banquet with the Lord. Yeah? 
when we're uh, when we're, we're we're in his presence at that banquet and he's there and all these different folks are there as well and relationships are healed and connected relationship with god relationship with one another relationship with the world and people just want to bless their neighbor and look out for them and stay close do you see that practicality and it can start with something as simple as a meal together there's unity there but there's tremendous diversity as well and it's fantastic and it's all about how we love one another love our neighbor love our neighbor loving and accepting start to become the overriding behaviors in that sort of environments they start to become the identity of those people the motivations for living relationships are as they should be they're not fractured they're not broken they're together it's a picture of the kingdom in a way and it's it's lovely it's lovely hold that thought because we're going to have our bible reading this morning and you're going to think to yourselves well how does that connect with what steve's just said well kind of hold that thought and watch this space our bible reading comes from the new testament this week from matthew chapter 19 it's uh, just a few verses verses 16 to 22 it's a story that we know well and hopefully i think helen out there in zoom world is going to read that for us so um helen if you want to unmute yourself when you're ready and give it a go thank you steve morning everybody just then a man came up to jesus and asked teacher what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied. There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones? He inquired. Jesus replied, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honour your father and mother, and love your neighbour as yourself. All these I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? Jesus answered, If you want to be perfect, go, sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. So COP26 is on the go and um, we've got COP26, we've got TV programmes by people like Attenborough and others. And it's, it's drawn us all into this, uh, this worldwide conversation about climate change and about the state of the Earth's environment. And the truth is, none of us really can claim ignorance of these things anymore. None of us. Um, we understand that by the end of the decade, they're telling us that something like 132 million people will be pushed into not just poverty, but extreme poverty by consequences of this climate emergency that everybody's talking about in Glasgow at the moment. Things like swollen lakes, floods, logging and deforestation practices, rising sea levels, seas full of plastic pollution and all that kind of thing. You've heard all this before, you know all of this. It's not news to us. But one of the real pluses of COP26 is that people are talking face to face. There are representatives from countries many, many miles away that are here talking to our people face to face. When you do this, it has this effect on us over there. That's basically what is going on. 
Folks in countries less affected by this or countries who perhaps are responsible for some of this, we might say, they're seeing and hearing firsthand the stories of places and people from far away. And suddenly it's not them over there anymore. It's not objectifying the situation. It's actually people with real faces and real names who are representing other people with faces and names. There's connections going on. Nations being represented by politicians and activists, names, faces, email addresses, telephone numbers being exchanged, connections are being made. And that is good because accountability is always harder to avoid when you know somebody, when you've got the connection. Whenever I hear of Beirut in the news, I read the article. Whenever it's on TV or on the radio, I listen because I know people over there. I've met them and it kind of affects me when I hear what's going on. There is, there's a hope about COP26 and um, th this hope is of this international togetherness, a coming together for the sake of our common humanity around the world, that whole global village thing. But for us, there's this phrase, what should I do? What should I do? It's the same phrase that we just heard in that passage of that rich young man, that rich young ruler. What should I do? A lady called uh, Carol Nang from Nairobi in Kenya. She's on the Tear Fund video for their COP26 service. That's worth a look online when you get home. But Carol makes the point that many of us, if not all of us in the UK, many of us Christians over here, we are like that rich young ruler really, in that we're having a conversation with Jesus about this situation. And a bit like this young ruler, we, um, we want to do good. We want to make changes because we can, we can feel that it's quite compelling, the argument that's being made. We're quite convicted of it. We want to, to kind of do our bit in this. But also, just like the rich young ruler, we're struggling. And we're struggling with the personal cost. We're struggling as to whether the cost is too high. When Jesus says to us, as he said to that rich young ruler, he says, go sell your possessions and give to the poor and then you'll have treasure in heaven. And I guess our equivalent of that conversation is when the Holy Spirit provokes us with words to that effect, when we compare how much we have here now in our country compared to millions, literally millions of folks far away in other parts of the world who just have so little. What shall I do? The hope for us in this story is when we read about the rich young ruler, we don't actually know how that story ended. We know that uh, he simply went away sad. He was wrestling with the issue. He went away sad because we're told he had great wealth. What questions, I wonder, did that young man ask himself, perhaps when he was at home or perhaps when he went to a quiet place somewhere to, to ponder Jesus and the challenge that had been laid at his door? What was he asking himself as he pondered Jesus' words? 
Did he think of his life and his house and his barns and his fields and his, his wealth, his businesses? Did he, did he think to himself, do I need all this stuff? Do I need all of this stuff? Did he think to himself, do I own this stuff or does this stuff own me? Am I possessed by it or is this my possessions? Did he think to himself as a very religious man, a spiritual man who was trying to draw close to God, did he think to himself, where does my theology of being blessed by God because I've got possessions, because God's been good to me, he's given me all of this, where does my theology of blessing fit with Jesus's words to care for the poor and invest in treasure in heaven. What, what are these real treasures, these treasures in heaven that Jesus speaks about? And do I, do I want to embrace those, discard some of this, the, the grip on this and embrace those instead? And the odd thing is, when we start listening into that conversation that that rich young man is having to himself, the odd thing is, his questions are actually quite similar to the questions we're asking ourselves at the moment, aren't we? As a nation, these are the, the things the politicians are wrestling with. What must we do? What must we do? Over the last couple of weeks, we've looked at things like our relationship with the land in Genesis chapters one and two. How do we care for something that God has made, something that is sacred before God, really? We've looked at our origins, our beginnings, our connection with the land, our relationship with God and with his creation. But Jesus' words to this rich, young ruler prompt us to think about our relationships with others, our neighbors, our international neighbors, our brothers and sisters, those Christian folks out there all over the world. Our disconnection to one another in an international sense, a global sense, this challenge of our communal identity. We are a worldwide community. That's what this climate change crisis has identified, that actually we are a worldwide community. We're in it together. What happens over here affects what happens over there. We've got a communal identity. identity. And that's at the core of the climate challenge that we face. And this breakdown of relationships between human beings throughout history shows how far humanity has kind of deviated from the course that God had originally got planned for us, for us, his image bearers, who were designed to have great connections with God, great connections with the world, and great connections with one another, made in his likeness. And so much of that got broken. And so Jesus, as Jesus speaks these words to this, this rich young man, sell your possessions and give to the poor, what are we hearing today in the context of COP26? Is it all about guilt? Is this another guilt trip that Steve's taken us on here? Is that what's happening? Is it all about greed? Or might there, might there, in this COP26 conversation, might there be a whisper about our calling and our identity as kingdom people? Because to paraphrase what Jesus said about the poor, he's saying to the rich young man, use your wealth to take care of the vulnerable. That's who you are, if you're a kingdom man, a man of God, 
who is investing in treasure in heaven. Use your wealth, your power, your strength, your resources. Take care of the vulnerable. This is who you are, kingdom people. Living now on earth, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Living now on earth as kingdom people, enjoying that glorious heavenly banquet with others, having that attitude, that disposition, making changes to live in ways that love our neighbors locally, the practical stuff we do in the vicinity of Chesterfield, but also globally, being aware of things like our carbon footprint and how we do stuff has implications for others. And maybe we've got to start asking ourselves things like, are these changes that are being talked about, that we're being asked to make, are they sacrifices or are they investments for the sake of our children and grandchildren? Are these changes, are they sacrifices or are they actually course corrections to pull us back on track with where we should be going? Are these sacrifices or is God speaking to our moral compasses and inviting us to turn a little bit more in the direction of kingdom living? What must we do? What must we do? Well, I guess it's a bit about personal steps and you'll be thinking about that with how you use your homes and uh, all the rest of it. Don't want anybody switching the heating off and freezing to death in the winter. That's not what I'm saying, just for clarity's sake there, okay? Um, but I guess it is about our personal steps. It's about what we do at home how we use and invest our money and all those sorts of things, how we listen and respond to our children and our grandchildren. Have a listen to kids and how they see it, teenagers and how they see it. They are getting very animated about this. What sort of world do we want for them? And there's something for us to explore as church here as well, as people of God, as kingdom people. Um, the deacons have been looking at something called um, Eco Church, and um, we're looking for some guidance, some advice, and some direction as to how churches operate, not just with our buildings, but with things like our policies and how we do stuff as well. So John and Ruth are engaging with that for us at the moment, and we'll hear in due course a bit more about how we can bring some of this stuff into church life how we can, um, yeah, do our bit, if you like, as a collective, as church. And we'll hear about that as they uh, do their research and share with us in weeks to come. I think this is about actually recognizing a real truth here, a real truth that relatively we are among the wealthy in this very unbalanced, very unequal world. We are in this world of brokenness and broken relationships um, that we can be a part of a movement to address brokenness. The gospel is good news. We are good news people and it's good news in a fuller sense. And actually, let me rephrase and, and be clear, church, we are part of a movement that addresses brokenness in every sense. And we look forward to that banquet before the Lord with folks from every tribe and every tongue and every nation from across, across this world. And so living out those values now is important. Practicing those values is important. Following that compass heading um, and being good neighbors in a global international sense. Take heed to what's being discussed and let's pray, keep on praying for COP26 and uh, these um, discussions and negotiations that are going on.
Okay. Shall we pray now? Let's be still. Let's pray for uh, that big conference. Heavenly Father, we just want to um, pause, bring those international leaders to you, those negotiators. Father, everything that's uh, going on at COP26, firstly, Father, we pray that the decisions made and commitments given, that they, that they stick, that there's some real accountability and real business done here. Father, we bring this wonderful planet, this place we call home to you. We thank you for it. Thank you for the blessings of it. Thank you that it's designed to sustain life, to enable life to flourish. And so we think of all the the repercussions of climate change that we're here going on in um, various places around this world. Father, we bring those situations to you. And we ask that you would help us as a nation to have the courage to take a real initiative in this, a real lead in this and show the way. And for us as kingdom people, as Christians, as followers of Christ, to to role model something as part of our faith as to how we see and care for this world in its fullest sense father we bring these international leaders to you now in jesus name amen amen